California, the reading capital of the world. Today is a very important broadcast. Tonight, we are speaking with author, professor, and monetary policy expert, Dr. Stephanie Kelton, about her book, The Deficit Myth, the 99 Pages Book Club Book of the Year 2021. The paperback release comes out on March 9th. And look, if there is just one book you read this year, it has to be The Deficit Myth. Uh, and we are just so proud to have her on the show. I'm a big believer in her work. And I think her uh, discussion, her concepts, her policy proposals are absolutely what our nation needs to hear right now. So Dr. Kelton, welcome to the program and congrats on your, on your work. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, Stephanie, I, I, I'd love to just start off with your narrative. You know, what are the notable moments in your life that create one's career in, uh, in uh, the profession of modern monetary theory? <laughs> How do you get to that position? I mean, I, I stumbled on economics by accident, uh, to be perfectly honest. You know, I think I had as an undergrad, um, seven different majors, I think, over time. I mean, I, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I thought, you know, medicine, I thought law, I thought accounting, I thought finance, I, I bounced around for a good while. And um, I was doing an account, I was starting on my way on an accounting degree, and you have to take some economics. And I was pretty good at it. And um, I stumbled into a course, a microeconomic theory course of all things, right? It was one of my least favorite courses in terms of just content, because it's like, really, you know, micro theory, you want me to swallow what <laughs> all of this, but I had this incredible professor and, you know, I'm sure that happens for a lot of people. You walk into the classroom and you just get lucky and you have somebody who changes the trajectory of your life. And that's what happened to me. And so I went from thinking I was an accounting major to taking this micro class, which uh, was not inspiring in any way, except that he was, he was great in the classroom, just masterful. And I wanted to take another class with him because he was so amazing. And the next class I took was the history of economic thought. And then it's like, okay, you're, you sold me, right? Because that's where you, he had us read the original works of, you know, Adam Smith and Veblen and Marx and Keynes and Mill. I mean, just, you know, the whole array. And I was hooked on that stuff. So I ended up with a double major in finance and economics with this professor who said to me, you know, you should go on to graduate school. And that's the story. You know, I, I went on to graduate school and I started off at the University of Cambridge and I was there in the mid 1990s when um, there was so much debate taking place about the launching the introduction of the Euro and you know the Maastricht Treaty, which is the blueprint for the Euro, this common currency that was introduced in many countries in Europe. And there I was studying in England and the British were saying, yeah, I don't think we're gonna join you in adopting the Euro. I think we're gonna wait. They took this wait and see attitude. And they were saying to the rest of the European countries, you all go forward, we'll see how it goes. We'll watch and keep an eye. If it looks okay, we'll, we may join you later. And so I was there in the middle of those debates and all of a sudden I, I was part of this, you know, wow, why would it matter so much if you had your own currency or didn't have your own currency? And that was kind of a pivotal, I think, moment for me where uh, I started understanding um, the monetary system and why having uh, the pound and a floating currency that you control versus giving it up and joining this other monetary arrangement was so consequential. So let's break it down to the bare, like 101 uh, mm -hmm. of the thesis of your book. And I think maybe a good place to start is to actually understand what exactly is modern monetary theory and how do we contrast that with the gold standard? I think we kind of throw these terms out. Maybe uh, you could help us just for the average citizen, like what do these two terms mean? Well, so if you're on a gold standard, then you you know it's it's a particular monetary system. It's a, a way to arrange your currency where the government says, "Look, uh, I pledge to convert my currency into gold at a fixed price. You bring me my currency, I give you that many ounces of gold. You bring me that many ounces of gold, I give you that many units of my currency. Fixed, right? It's it's a commitment." 
And what I'm saying to you is that I am promising to convert my currency into something that I can run out of. My gold is finite, something I could run out of. So I have to operate my budget very differently when I'm making that pledge to convert my currency into something I can run out of versus the kind of monetary system that we have in the US today or that Britain has today or that Japan or Australia or Canada or so many other countries have. So, um, you know, the the nature of the monetary system really matters and you have degrees of freedom, additional policy space. You can do more as a government. You have more freedom to operate your budget in ways that are not like a household. When you're on a gold standard, you have to be sort of miserly, right? You have to be very careful about how much of your currency you put out there because every unit you put out there is potentially convertible into gold and you only have so much of it. So, you know, that's the, the fundamental difference is that one of them makes you behave a whole lot more like a household and the other one allows you to operate your budget like a big, beefy, strong currency issuer that knows that it can never run out of money. You know, that's a wonderful transition to, I think, a, one of the core thesis of your book is like the household and the government are two very different ways of managing a balance sheet, if you will. And one interesting di di uh, dichotomy you propose is this thesis that we think that the government was operate in a TABS, T-A-B-S framework, which is first we're going to tax and then we're going to borrow and spend. Like, our spending and borrow is a function of our ability to tax. But you actually offer a stab thesis, which is first, actually, we got to spend and then we can tax and, and, and borrow later. Spending is actually the first element. Can you explain what, what that means and why it's different? Mm -hmm. So you're right. I, and I say that, you know, this is a mnemonic. It's just my way of imagining some helpful way for people to picture the way we've been taught to think of the government's finances. And so when I when you say the TABS model, that's the model I'm trying to debunk, right? And TABS, I put it in parentheses, T-A-B. The T-A-B is taxing and borrowing. And so what Margaret Thatcher said, and I quote her in the book because she said it so plainly. She said, the government has no money of its own. There is only taxpayer money. There is only the money that you, the taxpayer earns. We can take some of that and there is your savings and we can borrow some of that. So we can tax you or we can borrow from you. And after we do those things, we have money. And once we have money, we can spend. So spending comes last. You have to arrange your finances first, then you are in a position to spend. And what I argue in the book and the whole, you know, much of the point of MMT is to get the sequencing right, to show people how government finance actually works. How do government budgets really work? How does the government really spend? By logic, right? The government cannot tax you and collect dollars or borrow dollars from you until they have first made the dollars available because you can't create the dollars. They can't come from you. They can only come from government as the issuer of the currency. So, you know, obviously the government can't come to you and demand that you pay dollars in taxes until they have made those dollars available to you. They can't borrow your dollars until you have some dollars. So the spending has to come first. The currency issuer has to first make its currency available by spending or lending it into existence before the rest of us can have it and use it to pay taxes or borrow. So it's just, you know, it sounds like a subtle thing, just going from tabs to stab where spend comes first and taxing and borrow comes later, but it's extremely important, right? It, in terms of understanding how it all works. And when you hear politicians, if they're talking about wanting to do big, both infrastructure or climate or healthcare or education, whatever they want to spend money on, you know that the big question they always get, they're confronted with from some journalist or they're on TV and they say, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? What is that question? That question is asking who's going to pick up the tab? And that's why I like the tabs 
thing, right? Who's going to pick up the tab? Where is the money going to come from? And what I'm trying to do is say, it's not a gold standard. You don't have to go find the money. You know, we're not digging in a, digging a <laughs> hole in the ground to do this anymore, right? It's a different monetary system and it works differently. And we got to get the sequencing right so that we can get the thinking right so that we can get the policy right. Super interesting. So if we are talking about inflation then as the metric of what government services cost in my head i think well inflation is kind of a it's a it's a ratio right there's a numerator and a denominator and in my head and please feel free to correct me if i'm wrong i'm obviously not an expert here but when i think of inflation uh, we're talking about the the things costing more money right and we're sort of divide and i'm kind of curious what this ratio is like the change in the supply of dollars is obviously one element of it but what's the i guess the, and that might be the denominator What's the numerator? What is the value that's actually that we're actually dividing amongst more dollars? Okay, so I think we should we should set that aside. And okay, please, not, yeah, tell me. Not think in terms of the money supply because I think this is part of the problem that you and I were both. I'll bet you we were both trained to think exactly the way that you just said. Somehow, inflation has to do with the supply of money, and if the supply of money goes up, then inflation somehow goes up because more supply means higher higher inflation somehow right and this we can talk about where that comes from and milton friedman and the quantity theory of money and all this kind of stuff let's put that aside Boom. so done so, i did to be honest my mba professors would all tell you that i never got it to begin with so no, no, too no. Easy. <laughs> no, no. i mean the thing is there is not a person on earth anywhere that you could sit down and talk to who could write down for you a model of inflation, a, a model that works to help you forecast, understand, explain inflation at all moments in time. We don't have it. It doesn't exist. So inflation is a complex dynamic phenomenon that is meant to um, have us think about, you know, a continuous increase in the price level. So what is that? You can you point to the price level? Can I I can't point to the price level. It's not I can't see the price level. We try to get a sense, right? What is the price level? So we construct these things called price indices. And people have probably heard things like the CPI or, you know, um, this is not hot stuff we think about on a daily basis, most of us, but there are these indices, and this is how we try to measure inflation. So, you know, very um serious wonky people sit around and build price indices and they decide, you know, we want to try to understand what's happening to prices so that we get a sense of what the average consumer is facing month over month, year over year. What is the what is the impact on the consumer budget as prices change? So we we construct an index and we say, well, how does the average person spend their income? Well, they spend a good bit of it on healthcare. They spend a good bit of it on housing. They spend a fair bit on education and transportation and energy. We decide, you know, food, entertainment, clothing. We build that basket to reflect the consumption patterns of the average consumer. The more important any one of those items is, healthcare, housing, transportation, education, the greater weight we give it in the basket. And then we track over time what's happening to the prices of these things. We know some things become more expensive over time and other things become less expensive. So it's about what happens on balance to the prices of the things that are in that basket. And then we say, is it becoming more expensive to buy that basket of goods over time? And if the basket is getting more and more expensive over time and your wages aren't keeping up, then in real terms, you're falling behind. But if the basket is getting more expensive and your wages are climbing, you know, commensurate with that, then you say, well, you're not falling behind. Right. So inflation's tough. It's tricky. You can have inflationary pressure because, you know, uh, rental, you know, costs a lot more for housing, costs a lot more for health care and oil price shock drives energy costs way up. So Inflation is tricky and most of it is probably down to a struggle over income shares. It's about, you know, how much goes to labor versus capital and that struggle to have pricing power to be able to protect your profits and um, and move prices higher versus workers ability 
to move prices and wages uh, in their direction. And I don't know, it's, it's a complicated question. It's, it absolutely is, but it's yeah. very important. And I appreciate you have like kind of getting me to see the forest through the trees is, is really what you're helping me do. You know, it's like if inflation by itself is, is a, an incredibly complicated thing to talk about and discuss, then let's put it aside. Let's focus on what actually matters at the kitchen table. And so maybe we could actually make this more tangible. Like, let's take a like, let's take an issue uh, specifically. Uh, let's say education, for example. There's a push. Let's just generally say there's a push that uh, we want to have uh, more affordable higher education in this country, and it's expensive. It's going to cost the government on paper what looks like a lot of money. So as a po let's say you were advising a policymaker, which by the way you did for many years of your life and continue to do. Um, how do you spell out? the actual cost or how do you spell out the consequences to a politician and say like, look, I get it on paper. This money looks like a big number to pay for education, but you're thinking it in the incorrect way. I need you to put that dollar amount aside. How do you get the, what, what's the sales pitch, if you will? Well, I mean, I, I think you have to lead with your values. If you're, if you begin by starting with numbers, you're going to end up in a bad place because everyone will pick apart your numbers. You're, your cost estimates will be off, your revenue estimates will be off, everything will be unrealistic and everyone will start fighting over, you know, how um, realistic your, you know, estimated costs are uh, and so forth. So if you believe, as I do, that um, education is a public good and that we ought to have, uh, people ought to have the ability to go to public colleges and universities all across the country tuition free, then the question is, how do you resource that, right? How do you deliver on that? Because the money is the easiest part. That's the point, you know, that I'm trying to emphasize in the book is that we spend so much of our time bogged down with how will you pay for it? What will it cost? Where will the revenue come from? We're asking mostly all of the wrong questions and not paying attention to the questions that are the real challenges, which I just suggested is how do you resource it? If I promise that every person in this country who wants a, a college education can go to a public college or university tuition free and get a four year degree, how do we resource it? In other words, do I have the faculty? Are there enough seats in classrooms? Are there places for people to park? Are there dorms? Are there, you know, are there labs? Are there um, graduate teaching assistants? Are there light? Is does a library have the capacity? Like that's the real resource capacity. And to make good on that promise, you've got to be able to deliver what you're promising, which is the actual education, the experience in the classroom and with the faculty and so forth. The money's the easiest part. And that's the part that always hangs us up. So it really is about shifting the debate in onto an entirely different terrain where, you know, if you could just imagine, you know, a it's almost like trying to imagine a game board where you have pieces, right? And you have to move the pieces around to achieve where it is you're trying to go. And if, if you don't have enough pieces, you can't get there, right? You need the pieces. And so part of the strategy might involve training and hiring uh, enough faculty and enough additional, you know, administrators or whatever you need, you know, to get the capacity in place to have free public college. Well said. So we got some questions coming in from our viewers. If it's okay, I'd love to turn sure. to them. So we have, uh, and, and uh, Shankar Venkatraman and Chelsea, uh, I would love, Chelsea Jacobs, I'd love to combine your question to, to one because I think they're they're uh, related. Uh, Shankar asks, uh, so why isn't the government printing money at will if inflation isn't going to be directly impacted? Like what is that, I guess, the backstop? And I think, you know, to, to that point, you know, We'd like to know what is stopping politicians from getting this sequencing right? You know, the 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 stab versus tabs model. And I feel like these questions are related in their just very sort of like pro policy process uh, implications. Uh, could, could you speak to those if, if that's OK? Sure. Look, I think that if we if we're paying attention to what Congress has done for the last year, what is today? Or it's March, right? Year, yeah. a year since COVID really hit the US that we have been doing this for one year. And what has Congress done? Okay, 
they have spun out bill after bill after bill, spending, spending legislation, right? Congress has committed trillions and trillions of dollars. They got together, they voted for a spending package, they authorized the spending, boom, the dollars go out. There was no tax increase. If you're thinking of the TABS model, they didn't say, well, now whose taxes are we going to raise to pull this off? There was no tax increase. They didn't say, now where are we gonna borrow these dollars? Do you think China will finance <laughs> think It didn't happen. Congress has the power of the purse. And if the votes are there, the funding is there and Congress knows this. So we have, you, you know, I'm sure people who are tuned in now know that yesterday the Senate moved forward on a 1.9 essentially trillion dollar uh, COVID relief package, which comes on the heels of all of the additional uh, of the previous legislation that has been passed, the CARES Act of 2.2 trillion, the 900 billion that was moved in December of last year. So the, the answer is they know. They know that when they deem something a high enough priority, that all it takes to fund the spending are the votes. And if the votes are there, the money is there. And so they, uh, believe me, they know the spending comes first and everything else is secondary. And you know, there are ways that in the future, Congress could start writing legislation differently. They can write a bill that says, we are committed to doing two or $3 trillion of infrastructure spending. And we also want to raise a variety of taxes to offset that spending. They can do that, but they don't have to do that. So your question about inflation is important. I want to make sure to address it because Please. all of this spending that has taken place over the last year, every one of these relief bills, has been pure spending. One set of instructions sent to the government's bank, the Federal Reserve, that said, go make these payments. Congress has authorized them. Your job is to make the payments on behalf of the US Treasury. The Federal Reserve carries out those payments. How does it do that? Well, it marks the, changes the numbers in the appropriate bank accounts. It uses a computer keyboard and new digital dollars are born. Okay, that's what's happening. Now, the person asking the question is quite right to say, at what point would this become a problem, right? <laughs> then we're sending $1,400 checks. Why not $14,000 checks? Why not 140,000? I mean, if, if Congress can just conjure the money into existence, why be so stingy? Why not, you know, 100? And the answer I hope is obvious which is that um, there is a limit. And at some point you could put too much money into our hands and we could turn around and try to spend that money into an economy that doesn't have the productive capacity to produce the supply to meet all of that demand. And if you've got demand going way up here and supply struggling to keep up, well, the punishment for that is going to be inflation. Very interesting. Um I had a follow up to your point about like, you know, Congress knows this and the money's there if the votes are there. Why is it then that, and you talk a little bit about this in your book, we always seem to talk about the spending limits when it comes to things like education, healthcare, uh, and, and at times infrastructure, but rarely, like when I got sent to Afghanistan, no one was talking about how much it would cost. <laughs> you know, when we started talking about tax cuts, or even like you said, the COVID stimulus, we didn't really talk about like t increasing taxes for any of those. Like, what is it about certain issues that drive the spending debate uh, versus others? Like, I mean, in your time at Capitol Hill, like, why is it that like education, infrastructure, healthcare, uh, things like that, just draw the scrutiny of uh, quote unquote, fiscal conservatives? Well, because we have, we are ideologically different. We have different values. Um, we do not share the same core values when it comes to funding, you know. I mean, I will say with respect to defense, this one is a special sort of category, right? Because there is widely bar bipartisan support for uh, the defense spending. And every year when the Defense Reauthorization Act comes up, it's like, you want, you're asking for 720 billion? Are you sure that's all you want? Because we feel like we wanna give you 738 billion. <laughs> I mean, literally, the, the White House and the Pentagon will ask for a certain amount of money and a hundred senators will walk through the door and say, 
I don't think it's enough. I think it should be, I think it should be a bit more. And they'll just vote for even more to authorize even more than the White House had requested. And these, this will pass with 89, 92 votes. So this is an, a, this is a budget item that has broad bipartisan support. Um, so I don't want to suggest that there, there are the ideological divisions. Forgive me, yes, defense, of course. Yeah. Right? That's one of those where there's a whole lot of, uh, of support from both parties. But yeah, obviously on, on a variety of things, the two parties just fundamentally differ in terms of, you know, how many dollars they'd like to allocate or, or take away from certain parts of the budget. They're, they're different. So, you know, Congress has the power of the purse. They could double Pell Grants and provide more support for education and funding and so forth. But roughly half of the U.S. Senate doesn't want to do that, you know, and, and we could go down the list with with other uh, categories of spending. So super interesting. I mean, th this topic is just uh, kind of mind blowing from when I had when I read your book, I was it, it sh shifted my perspective in, in, a, in a lot of different ways. So. I want to get to something that I think is very important. And I know we actually had quite a few questions come in through the chat, but I just want to move on a little bit to what I believe is honestly the reason why I invited you on, which is this policy proposal of the federal job guarantee. Uh, this to me, just according to like my value system, just when I heard about it, it just clicked. Um, and I would like to just have you introduce it uh, for a minute. Would you mind telling, talking a little bit about what the federal job guarantee really is and why it might help us in today's day and age. So sure, you know how you hear people talk about um, health care and some people say, well, we should have a public option with, in health care where the government will say, if you want your health care delivered this way, there's always a standing offer on the table. The job guarantee is a public option in the labor market. It is an offer of employment at a standard wage and benefit package. So if you want a job that pays you $15 an hour and comes with these benefits and you can't find anything else anywhere in the economy that suits you, you always have this at the ready, right? It's standing by, it's there for you. There's no time limit. You don't have to qualify. It is a guarantee. Anyone can have it at any moment in time. So it works. Um, it does so many different things. It is a really powerful way to stabilize the whole economy because, you know, we're a capitalist economy. We are a market economy and market economies are dynamic. We go through periods of boom and then we go through periods of bust. We have recoveries and recessions and reco we're never going to eliminate the business cycle. We're always going to have our ups and downs. So a job guarantee is this program that's in place, ready and waiting to catch anyone who falls, you know, through the cracks in uh, as an employer, for whatever reason, finds that I, I can't make it with the workers I have. I'm going to shed workers, maybe for good reasons, maybe for not so good reasons. But if your employer lays you off or cuts your hours and you don't have the benefits and the, and the income that you need, there's something standing by that you always have access to. So in a recession, in a downturn, this is really important because instead of a millions and millions of people becoming unemployed and the longer and deeper the downturn, the longer people stay unemployed. And you will hear people like, um, Janet Yellen, our Treasury Secretary, talk about scarring effects. You know, people get damaged through unemployment. You, it's not just, you know, gosh, I, I feel bad because I'm unemployed and I, I'm depressed and I can't support my family. There are a lot of social and economic costs that are associated with unemployment. The longer you're out of work, the deeper those costs become, right, in terms of you know, social and mental and economic, and you at some point become unemployable. Employers don't like to hire people who've been out of the um, out of work for a long period of time. Your work habits deteriorate and so forth. So this is a place that catches you immediately, reemploys you, keeps your skills maintained, upgrades skills, provides additional training, and uh, allows you to do something useful for the community. It's a federally funded program that's locally administered. So the community is saying, these are things of value to us. And people can contribute in ways, you know, big and small in their communities, 
get a living wage to do that. And as the economy recovers, they can return to work in the private sector. They can transition out of that program back into the private sector. And so it works like a shock absorber in your car. It, it makes the ride smoother so that when the economy goes through these inevitable ups and downs, you get a smoother ride. It's more humane. People have you know, the opportunity to stay engaged, stay employed, have their income protected, their benefits secured. Um, and it, there are just a variety of benefits to the program. So is there not a point though, like let's say uh, that uh, we go through a downturn, we have a federal job guarantee and we start recovering and uh, we decide that our national values require a, a national education plan. We got to hire people to build the, the, the parking lots and the, for the, for the university of people park, like, all the limitations that you addressed earlier. I mean, at some point, aren't we actually distorting the labor market with governmental projects that actually makes it harder for small business to compete in the labor market? No, I mean, the whole point of this program is to maintain a ready, well, I shouldn't say the whole point, uh, one of the features of this program is that you are maintaining a buffer stock, a ready pool of skilled, employed people that the private sector can have anytime they're ready. All they have to do is pay a small premium to get them out of this program and into the private sector's hands. So what you're doing is you're maintaining the liquidity of the labor market. You're keeping it liquid so that it doesn't, part of it doesn't rot out and become unuseful, right? The mm. long-term unemployed, where the labor scarring and so forth. Honestly, if you said, um, you know, come to me with the most pro sort of business uh, idea that you can come up with, I'd probably say, you know, Medicare for all and a job guarantee, because with a, with a Medicare for all program, you're taking healthcare off of the books of private employers and with a job guarantee, you're making sure that they can always have access to a, a pool of employed workers that they can dip into when they're ready so that it is easier to um, hire and ramp up production when they're ready to do that. So I think it's it benefits both the employee and the employer. And the purpose of the program is not to compete with the private sector. It's to enhance the functioning of the labor market and to smooth the business cycle. I like that. It's, it's, and, and I appreciate both the analogy of the shock absorber uh, per, as a means of like making the, the ride a little bit less bumpy during the hard times. I think that's a really an astute observation. Uh, we had a clarif clarifying question coming through the chat. That's okay. Will these be solely federal and state jobs? Or are we asking businesses to set aside positions as well? Uh, and I think that's kind of interesting in the in in a context of say government contracting. Like, do those contractor jobs kind of count in this pool, or are these actually like W two federal, state, and local employees? So they're not. Uh, the answer to the first part of your question is no. That you are not counting um, people hired by private employers. That that is not part of the federal job guarantee. In other words, we're not trying to subsidize private sector employment. If the private sector wants to hire workers, they ought to hire workers. And this is a program that, you know, provides an option for people that the private sector does not currently have a use for. Right? That those are the people that the private sector has decided for itself, it does not wish to hire. So the job guarantee takes those folks, employs them, keeps them employable, and releases them to the private sector when the private sector is ready to hire from that program. So as a taxpayer myself, I expect a lot out of my government services. And if these people aren't employable by the private sector, like what can they do for our government? What are some of these jobs looking for? Uh, what do they look like? Well, it, I, I mean, I think your imagination is the limit in terms of <laughs> There is so much work that needs to be done. You can drive through communities all over this country and see readily with your own eyes, uh, probably dozens or hundreds of things that have been untended to, useful things that could be done 
that are, have just been neglected. So, you know, for people who want to look at this, uh, I talk a little bit about it in my book. My book is not focused on the job guarantee, but I do answer the question, what kinds of jobs could people perform? Uh, I co-authored a report that was published by the Levy Economics Institute on uh, federal job guarantee, a path to full employment. People can look at that. Uh, for answers. And you can also look at a book that was published around the same time as mine uh, by an MMT economist named Pavlina Cherneva. And her book is all about the federal job guarantee. So she gets very deep into these questions about the kinds of jobs that would be performed. But broadly speaking, here's the answer. Think of the jobs as all being oriented in one way or another around building a care economy caring for people, caring for communities, caring for the planet. Now that's pretty big tent kind of stuff, right? That's a, you're casting a wide net. So what do, you, what do you do when you care for the community? Well, the point is that the federal government funds the program, but the local communities and the people living in them, they decide what is of value to them. The federal government doesn't know what people living in Northeastern Oklahoma need. The people living in Northeastern Oklahoma know what they value and what their unique needs are. So the jobs are supposed to come from the bottom up. People living in the communities, local governments in concert with state government officials, they approve the jobs uh, and then those jobs get performed. But you know, think of care work, elder care, child care, community gardens, dealing with climate change, monitoring invasive species so that farmers are protected you know, from uh, having you know their crops uh, invaded and and crop losses and so right. I mean, we could go an hours and hours just thinking about the kind of things that people in these programs could do. But the idea is that it's it is a value to the community. How do we know that? Because the community said so. The jobs are coming from members of the community themselves. So you're telling me that we can take the unemployed people of our society, the, the ones that the private sector has either chosen for whatever reason, economic or skill sets wise, have chosen not to hire. We can give them jobs that will actually help problems in our communities, dictated by the communities. And our, the cost to our country is inflationary. We have, we, you know, it's about our value systems. And I can't think of anything more American in values than a job, right? The job is the vehicle of how you get your health care in this country, how you get your retirement in this country. It's how you pay taxes in this country. Like the job is kind of the kind of the building block of everything we are. Why is this not done yet? Like, what are the obstacles? What 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 keeps this from becoming a reality? I mean, you, you know, you've got to have enough. It's the votes, right? Everything comes back to the votes fund the programs and someone has to initiate the an idea like this. And actually, just within the last week or so, we had a member of Congress introduce a resolution for a federal job guarantee. And it was a pretty big deal, right? Uh, it was Congresswoman uh, Ayanna Presley who introduced a, uh, a resolution for a federal job guarantee. And she laid it out and she said, this is what this is a direction I would like to move toward. So we, that is a resolution is not a, a spending bill that will come soon. Uh, and I know that they're working on that, but we'll see what kind of support uh, there is in the House for something like this. But, you know, with with FDR, you had an alphabet soup of job programs, but you had the Great Depression and you had millions and millions of people out of work. And desperation does breed creativity, right? When you have a real mess on your hands, people can get pretty creative. And you say, I got millions of unemployed people, a lot of unemployed men. Uh, this isn't going to end well. We got to figure out something for these folks to do. And you had the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration. You had a National Youth Association, an NYA for jobs for young people. So, um, you know, people can can get creative when they when they feel like there is a, a crisis and a need. And uh, but we shouldn't have to wait for that because you know every unemployed person is uh, is value is a value and wants a way in. Unemployment is by definition somebody who's looking for paid work. They want to contribute. They want to do something and they can't find a pathway in. So why not create a job? Lord knows there's enough uh, valuable work to be performed out there. And, and we ought to, you know, unemployment is costly. 
there, we can't think. You you mentioned uh, the cost and inflation, and you know I mentioned that Levy report earlier. We modeled this. We said, what if the federal government actually had a job guarantee? How many people would come in? What would it cost, and what would be the macroeconomic effects of running a program like this? And so what we did was run this through a large scale macro uh, simulation and ask the question, tell us what would happen to a range of economic metrics, real GDP growth, inflation, interest rates, and so forth. And what we found is that the program would um, employ on average about 15 million people that you could finance this program federally, hire all the people who come through the door give them something useful to do, the impact on inflation is minimal. I mean, minim not even a 1% jump in inflation. And the impact is very short term because you basically get a one-time increase in wages and prices and then it peters out. And so it is not inflationary. It doesn't lead to you know fiscal ruin or anything like that. We're talking about a government with a sovereign currency funding the program and you get all of the economic benefits. Of, of doing this. So, you know, we modeled it out and um, and you get tremendous benefits from doing something like this. Oh man, I'm a, uh, I mean, obviously everybody knows you, if you hopefully you've seen the rap song we wrote uh, for 99 pages on yeah. uh, the federal job guarantee, we care a lot about this issue. It's, it's American, right? We want, like, this is not a handout. This is the American hand up. Like it, it just seems such, like such a common sense policy. I might be blinded by my idealism and my affection for your book, but uh, I'm so glad that you are are promoting this issue. It's exceptionally exciting. So thank you for your work on it. Um, how, like I know, I mean, we've got uh, like lots of people watching right now. I'm just curious, like if if somebody wants to get involved, I mean, I, I encourage you to call your congressman. We've actually posted the article uh, in the chat, uh, so go ahead and take a look at that uh, announcing. Uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Presley's uh, proposal. So take a look at it, call your congressperson, see if they're interested, see where they are on the issue. Um, after that, Dr. Kelton, what are some things that just us average Americans can do to, uh, to get involved and support this issue? I mean, every average American is different. Look what you're doing. I mean, I'll call you, you know, I, I consider myself an average American, so I do what I can, right? I tweet, I write, I do um, interviews. I just try to push the boundaries in whatever way I can. And you just raised a, a really good possibility, which is, you know, write your member of Congress. If people don't understand, or I, I think many people um, discount the value of reaching out personally to your member of Congress, those phone calls, those emails do not think that those don't matter. They do matter. They matter a lot. And when the phone lines are blowing up and the email is blowing up, that is, uh, it is not something they ignore. I know I worked in the Senate. I know the impact that that has when staffers are inundated with calls and they have to tell their member, this issue is important. People have been calling all day about this issue. So, you know, you, you take two minutes out of your day to reach out to your member and and tell them, you know, this. Listen, we we just saw something. Now you can you can have your issues with the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage not being in the one point nine trillion dollar COVID relief package that the Senate moved through yesterday. Uh, you can take issue with other parts of that legislation, but that was pretty big. I mean, one point nine trillion after the nine hundred billion in December, after the two point two trillion in the CARES Act, after I mean. You know, this is a significant improvement over what we got after the last uh, recession with the financial crisis and basically one big piece of legislation. And then Congress was like, we done. We yeah. have no hands. We are worried about deficits. We think we're out of money. We are stopping and we're going to put all the burden on the Fed. Let them figure it out because we've done our share. Not this time. Bill after bill after bill. And we all know that what President Biden wants next is a recovery package. He said, this thing we are getting now is a down payment. It's relief. He wants recovery. He wants another package that lays a foundation for a inclusive and sustainable recovery. So he's talking about potentially trillions of dollars more on infrastructure, climate, especially climate oriented and education and caregiving and so forth. So where are we going to go? And here's where your you know question is so important. 
because I think that part of the reason that this bill had to get through and lawmakers knew and every Democrat, you know, gave their vote and got this through is because it was so popular. Everybody wanted it. Democrats wanted it. Independents wanted it. Republicans were 60% of the population or more supported this bill. So when the next package comes and some of them start squawking about price tags and pay fors and deficits and stuff, we got to keep their spot. You got to keep them upright because they will, um, you know, there is some risk that they will, uh, they will waver and they need to know that we're, we're behind them and we want them to cast that vote for, um, you know, the kind of spending that is long neglected in so many different areas, education and infrastructure and climate, we have to tackle these problems. You know, I have a chapter in my book called The Deficits That Matter. And it's not enough to just stop with relief. We have to do, you know, some really strategic investments in our economy to redress long standing inequities and, and shortfalls. And so, whatever we can do to keep the pressure on. Yes, ma'am, we're gonna work on it. You know, and actually we had a great question come into the chat uh, before we leave the federal job guarantee. Uh, Gita asks, won't these short-term employment opportunities cause disruption when people find other better paying jobs? And I actually think this is an interesting question because a lot of these problems that are worth solving, namely infrastructure, for example, or climate change, these are problems that are gonna take decades to solve sometimes yeah. and so like let's say we have a federal job guarantee and we're in a recession we hire a bunch of people and then we start work on a big infrastructure project but then the economy recovers and they're like well wait a minute i'm, I'm gonna go to the private sector because i can go make more money outside like how do we keep these infrastructure projects or these long-term projects that are originally uh resourced with the federal job guarantee when when people leave and go to the private sector like, how do we keep these projects still afloat? What, why, what would keep them from stagnating? Yeah, so it's an, it's an important question. I'm glad that she asked it because you do not want um, to employ people in programs and projects where if they left the project, you have a half built hospital. That's not what you do. So the job guarantee is not for that kind of infrastructure investment. That is regular government spending. And in like the kind of infrastructure pro program uh, that we were just talking about, the next congressional package, I'm talking about doing regular old fashioned infrastructure spending where the government will contract with the private sector and they will build um, community health centers and they will do high speed rail and they will do broadband and they will do that. That is government funded infrastructure investment, not the federal job guarantee program. So, you know, anything that's worth doing on a permanent basis ought to be a permanent government funded job if that's the way you want to do it. That makes a lot of sense. Got yeah. it. So it's a uh, it, it's it's almost in what. So I guess what you do is you have to look for jobs that are creating value, but are acceptable to have a little bit of fluctuation as Ooh. Yeah, yeah, things improve. In the, in the WPA pro, uh, program, Work Progress Administration yeah, under FDR, you had street performers, you had theater. That was part of the WPA where you could go out and you could see musicians perform and artists perform and they would put on concerts and so forth. It's wonderful and amazing to have that and to be able to take the family into a community space and enjoy you know, some sort of a symphony production or something. Um, but at some point that might, you know, you might lose uh, the flutists and the other, you know what I mean? It's yeah. not, it's not going to be a permanent feature maybe, but, but <laughs> the community will miss it, but it won't be the kind of thing that disappears that's destructive uh, to the functioning of essential public services. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you what we need is a union of flautists. And yeah. if that ever happens, I'm, I'm gonna be the go. first one to sign up. <laughs> Community gardens, maybe in a, in a very small town, one of the proposed jobs could be, you know, the, the library. I go into the library, the bookshelf, this thing is, is falling down. And so all the books slide this way, they don't stand up. What we need is somebody to come in 
and a carpenter, somebody with some basic carpentry skills, build us a new bookshelf or shore these things up, paint, you know, paint. So you only have to do that once. It's not a permanent thing that needs to be done, but there's so much just in terms of maintenance. And, you know, you can think of community gardens. I mean, again, you know, the, the playground at the school, the basketball court, the concrete's all broken up and uneven and so forth. So get in there and give those kids a nice level uh, you know, basketball court to play on and, and do that. But that's a one-time thing, you know, it's not everything is a long lived kind of. Um, Makes sense. I, I, and I think that's a very important uh, clarification. So thanks for that question. Gee, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Look, this week's uh, Dr. Kelton, I was watching my portfolio in horror as we were making like monetary policy announcements, watching uh, Ch Chairman Powell, Chairman of the, the the Federal Reserve, like talk about interest rates, and everybody's sitting on the edge. You had a really fascinating <laughs> chapter in your book about handing control of monetary policy, namely the Fed, over to our fiscal policy owners, which is Congress. And you proposed some like self driving functions that would sort of automate spending in line with guardrails to make sure that we increased when the economy needed based on data and we decreased when the economy didn't need it based on data. And so can you talk a little bit about this? Cause I thought this was really forward looking and I think it got a lot of creative juices going for me. Uh, uh, maybe you could explain that to some of our viewers. Okay. So I, I want, let me be clear because not only does it maybe get some creative juices going, but it might also get some anxiety running through Jerome <laughs> and other people, the yeah. fed because we, we do not say, I, I, I think that what you have are two policy levers. You have monetary policy and you have fiscal policy. Monetary policy is the thing the Federal Reserve does. And most of the time, that's just supposed to be about changing the interest rate. In times like this, the toolkit expands and the Fed does a variety of other things. People might have heard quantitative easing and stuff like that. But mostly monetary policy in normal times is just supposed to be about the Fed adjusting a very special price in the economy called the overnight interest rate and trying to get that overnight interest rate at just the right level to achieve what Congress has given the Fed, which is a dual mandate. Congress said to the Fed, you have two jobs, give us high levels of economic activity, lots of employment, lots of jobs and good growth and keep inflation low. That's the dual mandate. So Congress is supposed to drive the bus. They have the steering wheel. I'm sorry, I said Congress, the Fed. The Fed is supposed to drive with monetary policy lever. And what MMT is saying, what I'm saying in my book is, that doesn't seem to work all that well. We've tried that for three plus decades. And what we've done is we've put too much pressure on central banks, not just ours, but other central banks around the world. We've given them too much responsibility and they just don't have a powerful enough toolkit to deliver on everything we are, we are asking them to do. What about this other lever? There's this other lever called fiscal policy. We should use it and engage it and use it more proactively. Instead of saying to the Fed, you fix the economy, you manage it, you steer, you drive, and Congress will just sit here with its arms crossed and say, not my problem. We're saying you gotta be engaged because you actually have the more reliable tool monetary policy works by driving people into debt. What the Federal Reserve can do is change the interest rate. When it wants to see the economy create more jobs, it lowers the interest rate. Why? So people will borrow more money. Why? Because if you borrow more money, the purpose of borrowing presumably is to spend. So monetary policy works by driving the rest of us into debt. You lower the interest rate. Ooh, credit is cheap. I think I'll buy a house. I think I'll buy a car. Now I'm on the hook. I have debt. Fiscal policy works by driving income into people. So that $1,400 check that's coming to tens and millions of Americans, fiscal policy is a check is coming your way. You own it free and clear. Have a good day, right? So fiscal policy works by driving income into people. That's better than driving people into debt in terms of the durability and long-term sustainability. So you kind of have both. It's not to say that monetary policy has no role and that private you know, borrowing is bad. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we need a better mix, right? 
and that there's this other lever, which is fiscal policy, and we ought to pull it more. Now, you said something about automatic and making the steering wheel turn on its own. Yes, let's do that. Let's do more of that. And why? Because fiscal policy requires Congress. Congress has to act. That's fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is changes in government spending and changes in taxes. And that only happens through congressional action. And we all know what congressional action looks like. It's messy. They don't act. They drag their feet. It takes months to get something done. So in the book, I say, whatever we can do to strengthen the automatic stabilizers, to make parts of the government budget move automatically, even if Congress is in a big huff, and um, unwilling to, to do anything and doesn't want to work together and wants to go on recess and home for the holidays, even if Congress isn't working, parts of the budget will move automatically in response to changing economic conditions. So if the labor market, if unemployment is high and people are hurting and struggling, then we continue providing support for people because the budget will automatically move resources in that direction. So, you know, it's like in your car, right? You have the cruise control button. You can take the steering wheel and do it on your own. You can pass a spending bill, not pass a spending bill, fight for a long time, you know, drive off a cliff, or you can hit the cruise control button. And all of a sudden the car just sort of like takes over, right? And well, I don't know, uh, maybe if you have a self-driving car, uh, the wheels start turning on its own and you can just pull your arms back and you'll, you'll be all right, you know? Um, so that's what we're talking about. Fiscal Super versus MMT. Yeah, we don't want to take monetary policy away per se. Um, we might have monetary policy do different things and, and use a bigger, um, more effective toolkit, but not to deny the Fed of any powers or anything like that. That's super interesting. You know, uh, I don't have a self-driving car. Um, Me neither. I, I got a Subaru. It gets me from A to B, <laughs> but, but one day I will. And uh, I, I love that analogy too. Uh, Dr. Kellen, we are so grateful for time. We have time for just one more question that I'd like to ask you. And uh, I know we actually had a ton of chat uh, coming in here in the, in the last few minutes. And I'm sorry, we just don't have enough time. Uh, but I will, if you don't mind, Steph, uh, Dr. Kellen, I'd love to just send you some of the questions maybe, and uh, oh, maybe yeah. send them back to our community. That'd be great. Um, but I want to give you an uh, I would love for you to speak a little bit on the final chapter of your book, because this is what really gripped me. Uh, you discuss Kennedy's call to action to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. Uh, to, and this is obviously a great example of MMT in action that has created massive amounts of return for our nation that we had no idea how to predict or measure beforehand. Could you talk about this in relation to MMT? And I, I think it'd be a wonderful way to close our discussion today. Well, look, M so MMT doesn't tell us exactly what we should do. It shows us what we can do. So if we can get, you know, rid of the imaginary obstacles, things that we think are barriers to progress. Oh, we don't have the money. Oh, we might go broke. Oh, we might turn into Greece. Oh, China might, you know, close the window and we don't get any more dollars. Oh, you know, all the things that we're told. Um, burdening the next generation, our grandkids, oh, the debt, oh, this. if we could get rid of all of the myths that hold us back and see clearly what the where the real limits are, right? There are limits. We have to see clearly where they are, but get a fuller appreciation for the capacity of the state, the government to spend. Then we could start having a very different debate. Like what are our national priorities for JFK? a priority was landing a man on the moon. And he made it a priority and he said, he went to Congress and he delivered a speech and he said, here's what I need from you to achieve this mission. And he asked for the money to do it. And that's the kind of thing that MMT is trying to pull us toward. It is trying to get us to think mission oriented. You know, if we had mission oriented budgeting, this COVID relief package, I'm gonna come back to it again because it is a significant piece of legislation, this 1.9 trillion. It is estimated that half of all the children who today are living in poverty will be lifted out of poverty as a consequence of this bill. That's mission oriented. What if we said, why just half? Why not all of them? What if we said, what about all the unemployed people who are still gonna be unemployed a year from now or two? Why not employ them? 
Why not? What is climate change? Why not? You know, set goals, make them objective and concrete and fit the budget to the mission. So much of the time we try to scale the budget, not to the mission, but we scale the mission to the budget. So we say, well, we think we could probably get away with spending another trillion. How much could we do to you know, impact climate on a trillion dollars? That's the wrong way. Set an ambitious goal. We want to be you know, carbon neutral, net neutral by 2030 or 2035 or 20. Set the goal and then fit the budget to the mission. That's what JFK did with the moonshot. That's the way we ought to think about this stuff. And then the real challenge is managing the inflation risk because the money can always be there. All you need are the votes. You get the votes, you've got the money. But structuring the legislation so that you can safely spend the money. And that word is important, safely, so that you can safely roll out that spending without creating other problems in the economy. And that's where a well-designed um, you know, piece of legislation, I think MMT has a, a great deal to offer in terms of you know, how we can be ambitious and bold and aspirational and get those moonshot uh, kind of policies in place but do it in a way that recognizes that the constraints we face are not financial. They're in our real resource, our productive capacity. So how do we manage the resources? How do we get the mission accomplished? And, you know, we can, we can do this. We just have to stop fighting about the things that don't matter and start having a, a better, more productive debate. Well said. And I love the phrase, scale the budget to the mission, not the mission to the budget. Yeah. Dr. Kelton, it has been nothing short of an honor to have you on the show today. Uh, 99 Pages Club, this is our 2021 book of the year. Uh, we don't give that award out lightly. I, you guys know us. Like We read book, like at least a book a week, sometimes two books a week. Like We are on a mission to make reading fun and achievable, and we picked this as the most important book for the entire year. If you read one book, this should be it. The paperback release for The Deficit Myth comes out on March 9th. Go to pick it up. It's an amazing read. I uh, personally uh, thought it to be incredibly insightful and a way to sort of break the, the log jam of this like rhetoric that we hear from both sides of the political aisle that drives us all insane. Uh, so I'm very proud uh, to have had Dr. Kelton on this book. Two calls to action. One, obviously pick up the book. And two, if you like the idea of the federal job guarantee, go and check out Ayanna Presley's, uh, Co Congresswoman Ayanna Presley's uh, bill. Call your congressperson, see if they're interested, find out where they stand on the issue and why. Get involved because let's face it, folks, we got some pain in this country to solve and it's on all of us to take ownership of it. So Dr. Kellen, thank you for being with us and best of luck to you on your paperback release this week. Thank you so much. It was great to be with you. Likewise. All right, 99 pages. We'll see you in a couple of weeks with some more content, some great books. Y'all have